I want to pick up this week where Pastor Maloof left off last week. So last week, Pastor Ryan was talking to us out of 1 Timothy 1, verse 5, which says, the purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. And Ryan talked to us a little bit about how God is dealing with our heart issues, He's dealing with our sin issues, and He's dealing with our trust issues. There's a lot of issues there, right? Yes? All right. Are you alive? So if you breathe, you probably deal at some level or another with heart issues, with sin issues, and with trust issues. And Paul says that God wants to touch those. He wants to deal with those so that you can learn to love and to be loved. Yeah? So that's good. Well, I was listening to Ryan last week and just kind of thinking about, you know, a common thread through all three of those, at least in my own heart and perhaps in yours, because I know that, you know, I'm an alien. I'm weird. Pastors aren't real people, right? That was my favorite one. was when one of my friends told me one time, you understand pastors aren't real people. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I thought I was. <laughs> but, but I don't know about you, but for me, when I think about heart issues, sin issues, and trust issues, the one common thread that runs through all of those as a barrier is fear, right? I, I, I look at those things and I think, God says, I want to deal with your heart issues. And I'm like, yeah, no, thanks. I want to deal with your sin issues. What sin issues? I'm practically perfect in every way. Just ask me. You know, I, I, I want to deal with your trust issues. Go, go, go talk to my wife. Deal with her issues. I'll help you. No, we have to overcome fear. We have to get at this point of how does God want to deal with our fear so that He can deal with us as a person so that he, we can become the full human person that He created, yeah? Because what He created when He made you was absolutely stunning and amazing. He impressed Himself. You know, it, the Bible says that. It says, He made mankind, and He says, it is very good. And when He made you, He thought, man, I did good work, right? And He wants to see you become fully what he's created. So to start that journey, that thought, I want us to consider a story. We actually find the story written down in 1 Samuel chapter 24. I'm not going to read out of that passage. I just want to tell you the story that you could read there if you wanted to. And it's the story of a guy by the name of David. Now, David's an interesting character because he is anointed king long before he actually becomes king. There's another fellow who's king at the time that he's anointed to become king of Israel. And that fellow's name is Saul. Saul didn't quite understand all this. He wasn't getting all this. He wasn't picking up. And so finally, God said, I'm having a V8 moment, and we're going to change horses here. And so he anoints David to be king, and, and off we go. Well, David, uh, God sends David to make Saul successful. Now, that's interesting, eh? Here's one king. He's not working out so well. So God's judgment of Saul is he sends someone to make him successful. And David did really, really good. But in doing really, really good, it exposed Saul's heart. And Saul responded to David not with, not with praise, not with gratitude, not with, wow, I'm so happy that God sent you to me, but with jealousy and envy and fear, right? So what happens is Saul rejects David. And David ends up running from Saul for years, and he eventually kind of collects this ragtag band of ne'er-do-wells and trains them to be an amazing army, and an army, in fact, as good, if not better, than Saul's army. This only pr further provokes Saul's fear. And so we see this period of time in David's life where he's running from his old boss and running and running and running and running. So we pick it up in chapter 24, and it's probably a Thursday. The Bible doesn't really say. We've forgotten. But let's just assume it's a Thursday. It's a normal Thursday. You wake up in a cave hoping that Saul doesn't find you and kill you today. Just like yesterday, just like you expect tomorrow will be, okay? He wakes up with his army. They found a nice cave. It's a nice deep cave. It goes back a ways. You can hide a couple hundred guys back there. It's a nice spot. There's only one way in, one way out. So if they decide to make a run at it, it's highly defensible position. It's a good place to be in this nice cave in the middle of nowhere. And it's here that, sure enough, their fears kind of come upon them. They hear the sound first of the horses, and then they hear the clatter of 
shields and swords, and they hear the chatter of men outside the cave, and they understand that this is Saul's army, and they found the cave that they're hiding in. And you hear a lot of barking of orders and stand down, and suddenly you, you see through the light at the front of the cave the silhouette, and, you, and, you, and, and David must have immediately recognized the man that tall could only be Saul. That was Saul himself. That was the king coming into the cave. And what does the king do, the Bible says? He drops trow, squats, and begins to relieve himself. It's in the book. I'm not making it up. For a while. So if you're David, some number of yards back, trying not to giggle, trying to restrain your laughter, aware first of the sounds and then of the stench. Here is the great mighty Saul doing his thing. And all of David's friends are looking at him saying, David, God has answered your prayer. He's weak. He's vulnerable. He's completely helpless. Take up your sword and kill him. And this is all over for all of us. We'll anoint you. You've already anointed king. We'll proclaim you king, and we'll be on our way. Now, David, David was a clever, clever young man. David understood, if I come to the throne by means of assassination, it means only that when I come to the throne and someone doesn't like what I do, they now have perfect legal precedent to assassinate me. So he has another thought. He goes to where Saul has thrown his robe, and he uses his sharp, sharp sword to very quietly cut off a piece of the corner. And suddenly his heart is stricken. It's, it, he, he, he recognizes immediately that he has now dishonored his king. And instead of feeling triumphant, he suddenly feels a wave of remorse. Well, Saul finishes his business, tidies up, I hope, exits the cave. And who exits the cave with him? But David. And he holds up the piece of fabric and then bows to his face. In other words, David put himself in the same posture, in the same position that Saul had been just moments previous toward David. And David says, I have dishonored you. I ask for your forgiveness. But why are you chasing me? Don't you see that if I'd wanted to kill you, I could have done it right now, All right? Probably some years later, probably in reflecting on that kind of a moment, because David, frankly, had a number of these kinds of strange military moments, but probably thinking back on this sort of moment, uh, he engages in poetry, and he writes what we now have is Psalm 27. And that's where I really kind of want to pick up this morning. So if you have your Bible with you, I'm going to read out of a different translation than what you probably have. And so that's going to be okay. We'll throw the words up on the screen, okay? But I want us to read Psalm 27, and we're just going to read the whole thing through and then sort of look at what did David really discover about overcoming his fears out of a situation like that. And so it starts this way. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble, He shall hide me in His pavilion. In the secret place of His tabernacle, He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted above my enemies, all around me. Therefore, I will offer the sacrifices of joy in His tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry. 
with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, I want us to take all the way back up to the very first bit of this poem. The very first verse of this poem says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? A lot of folks and even translations will try to take this and say that, well, the the poet here is being redundant in order to be uh, emphatic. And there's something to be said for that. That's a legitimate way to see this. But there's, I think, a deeper, richer thing here. And that is, he's saying, the Lord is my light, meaning what? God is the lens through which and the means by which I perceive everything and everyone around me. It is God that provides the way I see the world. And God is my salvation. I am one who is commissioned by God to advance his kingdom on the earth. I am like an ambassador from heaven here on earth. And that is a scary and risky place to be, except that God backs me up. Yeah? He says, you are my light and you are my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Now, this word fear is a little bit like the word awesome and awful and awe in the English language. And this is what I mean. There was a time not too, well, about a century ago, that awful, awesome, and awe all pretty much meant the same thing. The same root word. And it meant to be terrified of. But over the years, you know, language being sort of what it is, the word awful came to describe something terrible, to be dreaded, to horrible, right? And awesome meant something to be appreciated, something that was majestic and splendorous, something to be wowed by, right? So, the word fear here has a similar sort of journey in its original language. And the word fear here means what we would call awesome. In other words, he's saying, Who in my world is awesome like you, God? And because God is awesome, it is is the beginning place of worship, right? He says, the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? This is the word dread. This is where we might think of the word awful, Of whom shall I be terrified? And the implied answer is no one. If I land, if if I blah, if I land, yeah, that's exactly what I meant to say. If I stand in the place of awe, I need not fear anyone. 